Hello, and welcome to Fireside Fairy Tales. My name is Rory, and if you've never been here before, welcome. We, uh, <coughs> you're on Varietal Literature's YouTube page, and what we do here is enjoy all the variations of stories there are to enjoy. Um, and of course, being the spooky month, or the scary month, uh, we are working our way through some great horror and weird fiction and things like that and the theme tonight is of course um <clears throat> uh a forgotten horror stories from woman so what we're gonna read is actually some of our newest stories that we've ever read on the channel here um and uh they are going to be <laughs> they're not super long but they're longer than average so what that means is I'm not going to waste much time. We're going to kind of get right to it. But um, we're going to read two stories tonight. If you are new here and you've never been here before and you are not watching this live, down in the description below, there will be timestamps for the beginnings of each of the two stories we're reading. The first story we're reading is the one on the screen right now, The Tower by Marganita Lansky. Uh, Marganita Lansky was a writer of her own repute, but um, this is a short, traumatizing tale. Uh, and then uh, we're going to read after this one. The title, or the icon one, which is uh, Three Miles Up, which is by another writer. Now these stories come from the 50s, so they have a, a different feel to their style of telling. Uh, and they also make reference to, you know, different kinds of technology than you would normally have in the kind of channel, uh, stuff on this channel, the stories on this particular day. Uh, however, I'm sure we will manage it as well as we always do. Now, I'm sure the question sits in your mind is, uh, you know, nor Rory, you said you have to read old stories because they have to be in public domain. Are these in the public domain? Uh, these are a good example of why public domain probably shouldn't be take so long to get there. They're both out of print. They were very, very hard to source to begin with. A hobbyist basically transcribed one of our stories, and the other one's a scan of a book from over 60 years ago. So, um, <laughs> you know, trying to preserve stories under those conditions. I couldn't buy them. I couldn't find them if I wanted to. Anyways, our first story tonight is called The Tower by Marganita Lasky from 1955, I believe. I think they're both actually from 1955. The road begins to rise in a series of gentle curves, passing through pleasing groves of olives and vines. Five kilometers on the left is the fork for Florence, Italy. To the right may be seen the Tower of Sacrifice, 470 steps, built in 1535 by Niccolo di Ferramamo. Superstitious fear left the tower intact when in 1549 the surrounding village was completely destroyed. Triumphantly, Caroline lifted her finger from the fine italic type. There was nothing to mar the success of this afternoon. Not only had she taken the car out alone for the first time, driving unerringly on the right-hand side of the road, but what she had achieved was not a simple drive, but a cultural excursion. She had taken the Italian guidebook. Neville was always urging on. Her and hesitatingly, haltingly, she had managed to piece out enough of the language to choose a route that took in four well-thought-out frescoes. Two universally admired campanelli's 
in one wooden crucifix in a village church quite a long way from the main road. It was not, after all, such a bad thing that the British Council meeting had kept Neville in Florence. True, he was certain to know about all the Campanellis and frescoes, but there was just a chance that he hadn't discovered the crucifix, and how gratifying if she could at last have something of her own to contribute to his constantly accumulating hoard of culture. But could she still add more? Was there at least another hour of daylight? And it wouldn't take more than 35 minutes to get back to the flat in Florence. Perhaps there would be time to add this tower to her dutiful collection. What was it called? She bent to the guidebook again, carefully tracing the text with her finger to be sure she was translating it correctly, word by word. By this time, her moving finger stopped abruptly at the name of Niccolo di Ferramano. There had risen in her mind a picture. No, not a picture, a portrait of a thin white face with deep-set black eyes that stared intently into hers. Why a portrait? She asked, and then she remembered. <clears throat> it had been about three months ago, just after they were married, when Neville had brought her to Florence. He himself had already lived there for two years, and during that time he'd been at least as concerned to accumulate Tuscan culture for himself as to disseminate the English culture to the Italians. What more natural that he should wish to share, perhaps to even show off his discoveries to his young wife. Caroline had come out to Italy with the idea that when she had worked through one or two galleries and made a few trips, say to Assisi in Siena, she would have done her duty as a British council wife and could then settle down to examining the Florentine shops, which everyone told her were too marvellous for words. But Neville had been contemptuous of her program. <clears throat> you can see the stuff in the galleries at any time, he said, but I'd like you to start with the pieces the ordinary tourist doesn't see. And of course, Caroline couldn't possibly let herself be classed as an ordinary tourist. She'd been proud to accompany Neville to castles and palaces, privately owned to which his work gave him entry there to gaze with what she hoped was pleasure on the undiscovered Raphael, the Titian that hung on the same wall since it was painted. Giotto fresco under which the family had originally commissioned, it still said their prayers. Who had originally committed, commissioned it, had still said their prayers. It had been on one of these pilgrimages that she had seen the face of the young man with the black eyes. They had made a long, slow drive over narrow, ill-made roads, and at last come to a castle on the top of a hill. The family was, to Neville's disappointment, away, but the housekeeper remembered him and led them to a long gallery, filled <clears throat> and lined with five centuries of family portraits. Though she could not have admitted it even to herself, Caroline had become most anesthetized to Italian art. Dutifully, she had followed never along the gallery, listening politely well in his light, well-bred voice. She had told her intimate anecdotes of history, and involuntarily she had let her eyes wander around the room, glancing anywhere but at the particular portrait of Neville's immediate dissertation. It was thus that her eyes were caught by a face on the other side of the room, and forgetting what was due to politeness, she called her husband's arm and demanded, Neville, who's that girl over there? But he was pleased with her. He said, Nah, I'm glad you picked that one. It's generally thought to be the best in the collection. A bronzino, of course. And they went over to look at it. The picture was painted in rich, pale colors. A green curtain, a blue dress, a young face with calm brown eyes and the plates of honey gold hair. Caroline read out the name under the picture. Giovanna di Ferramano, 1531 to 
1549. That year was the year the village was destroyed. She remembered now sitting back in the car by the roadside in the present day. But at the time she had exclaimed, Oh, Neville, she was only 18 when she died. <clears throat> they married young in those days. Neville commented, and Caroline said in surprise, Oh, was she married? It had been the radiantly virginal character of her face that had caught her in attention. Yes, she was married, Neville answered and added. Look at the portrait beside her. It's Bronzino again. But, uh... I'm gonna lose my window. <clears throat> it's Bronzino again when you think of it. And this was when Caroline had seen the pale young man. There was no clear light colors in this picture. There was only the whiteness of his face. The blackness of the eyes, the hair, the clothes, and the glint of gold letters on the pile of books on which the young man rested his hand underneath his picture was written, Portrait of an unknown gentleman. Do you mean he's her husband? Carolyn asked. Surely they'd know if he was, instead of calling him an unknown gentleman. <clears throat> he is <clears throat> Niccolo di Ferramano, all right, said Neville. I've seen other portrait of him somewhere. It's not a face one would forget, but he added reluctantly because he hated to admit ignorance. There's apparently some queer scandal about him. They don't turn his picture out. They won't even mention his name. Last time I was here, the old Count himself took me through the gallery. I asked him about the little Giovanna and her husband. He laughed uneasily. Mind you, my Italian was far from perfect at that time. But it was horribly clear that I shouldn't have asked. But what did he say? Carolyn demanded. Uh, I tried to remember, said Neville. For some reason it stuck in my mind. He said either she was lost or she was damned. But which word it was, I can never be sure. The portrait of Niccolo, he just ignored altogether. What was wrong with Niccolo, I wonder? Mused Caroline. And Neville answered. I don't know, but I can guess. Did you notice the lettering on those books up there under his hand? It's all in Hebrew or Arabic. Undoubtedly, the unmentionable Niccolo dabbled in black magic. That's a very, like, <laughs> turn of the century to mid-century thing. Um, for whatever reason, Hebrew and Arabic uh, was the the language of, of a cult. <clears throat> Which, if you even take a second to think about, doesn't make a lick of sense. But you see a lot of that in Lovecraft, too. <clears throat> Caroline shivered. I don't like him, she said. Let's look at Giovanna again. And they'd moved back to the first portrait, and Neville had said casually, Do you know, she's rather like you. I've just got time to look at the tower, Caroline now said aloud, and she put the guidebook back in the pigeonhole under the dashboard and drove carefully along the gentle curves till she came to the fork for Florence on the left. On the top of the little hill to the right stood a tall, round tower. There was no other building in sight. In a land where every available piece of ground is cultivated, there was no cultivated ground around this tower. On the left was the fork for Florence. On the right, a rough track that led up to the top of the hill. Caroline knew that she wanted to take the fork to the left, Florence, and home, and Neville, and said a sudden urgent voice inside of her, for safety. The voice so much shocked her that she got out of the car and began to trudge up the dusty track towards the tower. 
After all, I may not come this way again, she argued. It seems silly to miss the chance of seeing it when I've already got a reason for being interested. I'm just going to have a quick look. She glanced at the setting sun, telling herself that she would indeed have to be quick if she were to get back to Florence before dark. And now she climbed the hill that was standing in front of the tower. It was built of narrow red bricks and only thin slits pierced its surface right up to the top where Caroline could see some kind of narrow platform encircling it. Before her was an arched doorway. Well, I'm just going to have a quick look, she assured herself again, and so she walked in. She was in an empty room with a low arched ceiling and a narrow stone staircase clung to the wall and circled around the room to disappear through the hole in the ceiling. So narrow. There ought to be a wonderful view at the top, said Caroline firmly to herself, and laid her hand on the rusty rail and started to climb. And as she climbed, she counted. 39. 40. 41, she said. With the 41st step, she came through the ceiling and saw over her head, far, far above the deep blue evening sky, a small circle of blue framed in a narrowing shaft, round which the narrow staircase spiraled and spiraled up. There was no place on the wall to grip, only a rusty railing protected the climber. 83, 84, counted Caroline. The sky above her was losing its color. She wondered why the narrow slit windows in the wall had all been so placed that they spiraled around the staircase too high for anyone climbing to ever see through them. It's getting dark very quickly, said Caroline at the 100th and 50th step. I know what the tower's like now. It'd be much more sensible to just give up and go home. At the 269th step, her hand moving forward on the railing met only empty space. For an interminable second, she shivered, pressing back to the hard brick on the other side. Then hesitantly, she groped upwards and at last two fingers met the rusty rail again. And again, she climbed. But now the breaks in the rail became more and more frequent. Sometimes she had to climb several steps with her left shoulder pressed tightly to the brick wall before searching. <clears throat> her searching hand could find the tenuous rusty comfort again. At the 375th step, the rail, as the moving hand clutched it, just crumpled away under her fingers, little bits of rust rattling down into the dark below. 422, 423, counted Caroline with part of her brain. Oh, I really ought to go down now, said another part. I wish, oh, I want to go down now. But she could not. It'll be so silly to give up, she told herself, desperately trying to rationalize what drove her on, just because one's afraid. And then she had to stifle that thought, too. There was nothing left in her brain but the steadily mounting tally of the steps. 470, said Caroline aloud with explosive relief. And then she stopped, abruptly because the steps had stopped too. There was nothing ahead but a piece of broken railing barring her way and the sky now drained of all its color, still some 20 feet above her head. But how idiotic she made to the air. The whole thing's absolutely pointless. And then the fingers of the left hand exploring the wall beside her met not brick, but wood. She turned to see what it was, and in the wall level with the top step was a small wooden door. 
Oh, so it does go somewhere after all, she said, and fumbled with the rusty handle. The door pushed open and she stepped through, but she was on a narrow stone platform, about a yard wide. It seemed to encircle the tower. The platform sloped downwards, away from the tower. Its stones were smooth and very shiny, and this was all she noticed before she looked beyond the stones and down. She was immeasurably, unbelievably high and alone. And the ground below was a world away. It was not credible, not possible that she should be so far from the ground. All her being was suddenly absorbed in the single impulse to hurl herself from the sloping platform. I cannot go down any other way, she said. And then she heard what she said and stepped back, frenziedly clutching the soft rotten wood of the doorway with hands sodden with sweat. There is no other way, said the voice in her brain. There is no other way. This is vertigo, said Caroline. I've only just got to close my eyes and keep still for a minute and it'll pass off. It's bound to pass off. I've never had it before, but I know what it is and it's vertigo. She closed her eyes and kept very still. Felt the cold sweat running down her body. I should be all right now, she said at last. And carefully, she stepped back through the doorway onto the 400th and 70th step. She pulled the door shut before her. She looked up to the sky swiftly, darkening with the night. Then for the first time, she looked down to the shaft at the tower, down to the narrow and protected staircase spiraling round and round and round and round and disappearing into the dark. For she could not see beyond it. She said, she screamed, I can't go down. She stood still on the top step, staring downwards, and slowly the last light faded from the tower. She could not move. It was not possible that she should dare to go down, step by step, the unprotected stairs into the dark below. It would be much easier to fall, said the voice in her head, to take one step to the left and fall and would all be over you cannot climb down she began to cry shuddering with the pain of her sobs it could not be true that she had brought herself up to this peril that there could be no safety for her that she could climb down the menacing stairs the reality must be that she was safe at home with neville but this was the reality and here were the stairs at last, she wiped her tears and stopped crying and said, Now I shall go down. One, she counted. In her right hand, tearing at the brick wall, she moved the first one, then the other foot down to the second step. Two, she counted. And then she thought of the depth below and stood still with stupefied the stone beneath her feet and the brick against her hands were two frail protections for her exposed body. They could not save her from the voice that repeated that it would be easier to fall. Abruptly, she sat down on the step. Two, she counted again, and spreading both her hands tightly against the step on either side of her, she swung her body off the second step down onto the third. Three, she counted, then four, then five, pressing close into the wall from the empty drop on the other side. At the twenty-first step, she said, I think I can do it now. She slid her right hand upon the rough wall and slowly stood upright. And then with her other hand, she reached for the railing. It was now too dark to see, but it was not there. For timeless time, she stood there knowing nothing but fear. Twenty-one, she said. Twenty-one, over and over again. But she could not get onto that twenty-second stair. Something 
brushed her face and she knew it was a bat, not a hand that touched her, but still it was horror, beyond conceivable horror. And it was this horror without any sense of moving from dread to safety that at last impelled her down the stairs. 23, 24, 25, she counted, and around her the air was full of whispering, stretched, skin-stretched wings. If one of them should touch her again, she must fall. 26, 27, 28, the skin of her right hand was torn and hot with blood, for she would never lift it from the wall, only pressed it slowly down and forced her rigid legs to move from the knowledge of each step to the peril of the next. So Caroline came down the dark tower. She could not think. She could know nothing but fear. Only her brain remorselessly recorded the tally. 501, it counted. 502 and 3 and 4 and that is the tower water break and then we will go on to our next story <clears throat> G.S. says, I wonder if the tower actually exists. I have no idea. Uh, I think it just sunk in. G.S. says, 500 with an exclamation mark. Yes. For those who maybe didn't pick up on it, I did try to emphasize it. Let's go back to the beginning of the story. Um, it says in the beginning, the Tower of Sacrifice has 470 steps. What it implies that she's 500 steps down is up to you to determine, I imagine. <coughs> But I feel like it really only has one interpretation. <coughs> Which is she is trapped there. Um, okay. Well, like I said, we got a lot of story to get through. So uh, I won't spend too much time on that. And we will go straight into three miles up. So this next story is Three Miles Up, a short story from Elizabeth Jane Howard. It's also from the mid-50s. Um, as a note, it comes from a kind of school of creep, creepy story and stuff, where it's a bit of a slow burn. Uh, so I did actually originally and think I should probably read this outside of Halloween and try to sell it as like a modern folktale because it kind of plays a little bit that way at first. Uh, knowing that it's coming in a horror stream does pull some of the wind out of its sails. However, it is uh, an accomplishment in atmosphere and mood. <clears throat> and uh, I'm actually just going to restart the music here. This is Three Miles Up by Elizabeth Jane Howard. And give it a bit. First half is slow, but it pays off. There was absolutely nothing like it. An unoriginal conclusion, and one that he had drawn a hundred times during the last fortnight. Clifford would make some subtle and intelligent comparison, but he... John could only continue to repeat that it was quite unlike anything else. It had been Clifford's idea, which considering Clifford was surprising. And when you looked at him, you would not suppose him capable of it. However, John reflected that he had been ill, some sort of breakdown these clever people went in for, and that might account for his uncharacteristic idea of hiring a boat and traveling on canals. On the whole, John had to admit 
it kind of was a good idea. He'd never been on a canal in his life, although he'd been in almost every kind of boat, and thought he knew a good deal about them, so much indeed that he had embarked on the adventure in a light-hearted, almost patronizing manner, but it was not nearly as simple as he imagined. Clifford, of course, knew nothing about boats, but he had admitted that almost everything had gone wrong with a kind of devilish versatility which had almost frightened him. However, that was all over, and John, who had learned painfully all about the boat and her engine, felt that the former at least had run her gamut of disaster. They had run out of food, out of petrol, out of water, had dropped their windlass into their deepest lock, and on, <clears throat> and more humiliatingly, their boat hook into a side pond. The head had come off the hammer. They had been disturbed for one whole night by a curious rustling in the cabin, like a rat in a paper bag, when there was no paper, and so far as they knew, no rat. The battery had failed, had had to be recharged. Clifford had put his elbow through an already cracked window in the cabin. A large piece of rope had wound itself round the propeller with a malignant intensity which required three men and half a morning to unravel. And so on, until now there was really nothing left to go wrong, unless one of them drowned, and surely that was impossible to drown in a canal. I suppose one might easily drown in a lock, he asked aloud. We must be careful not to fall into one, Clifford replied. What? John steered with fierce concentration, and <clears throat> never heard anything people said to him for the first time, almost on principle. Said we must be careful not to fall into a lock. Oh, well, there aren't any more now until after the junction. Anyway, we haven't yet, so there's really no reason why we should start now. I only wanted to know whether we'd drown if we did. Sharon might. What? Sharon might. <clears throat> Better warn her then. She seems agile enough. His concentrated frown returned. He settled down again to the wheel. John didn't mind where they went or what happened, so long as he handled the boat. And all things considered, he handled her remarkably well. Clifford planned, and John steered, and until two days ago, they had quarreled and argued over a smoking. An unusually temperamental Primus. Primus is like a camp stove, if you guys don't know. Um, which reminded Clifford of Sharon. Her advent and the weather were really... Two unadulterated strokes of good fortune. There had been no rain, and Sharon had, as it were, dropped from the blue onto the boat, where she speedily restored domestic order, stimulated evening conversation, and touched the whole venture with her attractive beam. The requisite number of miles each day were achieved. The boat behaved herself, and admirable meals were steadily and regularly prepared. She had, in fact, identified herself with the journey, without making the slightest effort to control it. A talent which many women were supposed in theory to possess, when in fact, Clifford reflect gloomily, most of them were bored with the whole thing or tried to dominate it. <clears throat> Her advent was remarkable, almost a miraculous piece of luck. He had, to bring her about, after a particularly ill-fed day and their failure to dine at a small hotel, desperately telephoned all the women he knew who seemed in the least suitable there were surprisingly few by the way with no success they had spent a miserable evening john determined to argue about everything and he clifford refusing to speak until both in a fine state of emotional tension they had turned in for the night while john snored Clifford had lain distraught, and his resentment and despair circling round John and then touching his own smallest and most random thoughts, until his mind found no refuge and he was left, divided from it, hostile and afraid, watching it in terror race on in the dark like some malignant machine utterly out of his control. The next day he had proven no better between them, and they had continued throughout the morning in a silence which was only occasionally and elaborately broken. They had tied up for lunch beside a wood, which hung heavy and magnificent over the canal. There was a small clearing beside which John then proposed more. But Clifford failed to achieve the considerable leap necessary to stop the boat, and they had drifted helplessly past it. I'm going to pause here for a second, because we're getting to more of the story proper. I think 
myself as well when I was reading this, it's easy to lose track sometimes of her writing. Uh, so just a quick summary here. Three men are riding on a boat in the canals around England, um, which at this time can be go through some pretty rural areas. And uh, they had sort of screwed things up so much that at one point they basically went to a hotel um, and uh, called all the women they knew. And then the woman rode with her for one of the women they knew, Sharon, rode with them for a few days, made meals, made peace amongst the men. And they were doing fine, but obviously she has gone. And they are back to each other's necks on this stupid boat trip that one of them proposed. It, just in case I sort of lost track there, because I, I had to reread some of these sections a few times myself. So hopefully that helps. <clears throat> John flung him a line, but it was not until the boat was secured and they were safely in the cabin that the storm had broken. John, in attempting to light the Primus, split spilt a quantity of paraffin, which is fuel. I mean, it's a wax, but it's a fuel. On Clifford's bunk, instantly all his despair of the previous evening had contracted. He hated John so much that he could have murdered him. They both lost their tempers, and for the ensuing hour and a half had conducted a blazing quarrel, which even at the time secretly horrified them both in its intensity. It had finally ended with John striding out of the cabin, there being no more to say. He had returned almost at once, however. I say, Clifford, come and look at this. At what? Outside on the bank. For some unknown reason, Clifford did get up and did look. Lying face down, quite still on the ground, with her arms clasping the trunk of a large tree, was a girl. Oh. How long has she been there? She's asleep. She can't have been asleep all the time. She must have heard some of what we said. Anyways, who is she? What is she doing here? Clifford looked at her again. She was wearing a dark twill shirt dark trousers. Her hair hung over her face so that it was almost invisible. I don't know. I suppose she's alive. John jumped cautiously as sore. Yes, she's alive all right. Funny way to tell lie. Well, it's none of our business anyways. Anyway, anyone can lie in a bank if they want to. Yes, but she must have come in the middle of our row. It does seem queer to stay and then go to sleep. Extraordinary, said Clifford warily. Nothing was really extraordinary. He felt nothing. Are we moving on? Let's eat first. I'll do it. Oh, I'll do it. The girl stirred and unclasped her arms and sat up. They all stared at her each for each other for a moment. The girl slowly pushed the hair from her forehead. Then she'd said, If you will give me a meal, I'll cook it. Afterwards, they had left her to wash up, taking her up on the offer, and walked about the wood. Well, Clifford suggested to John that they ask the girl to join them. I'm sure she'd come he said. She didn't seem at all clear about what she was doing. We can't just pick up somebody up out of a wood, said John, scandalized. Where do we suggest we pick them up? If we don't have someone, the holiday will be a failure. We don't know anything about her. I can't see that matters very much. She seems to cook well. We can at least ask her. All right, ask her then. She won't come. When they returned to the boat, she had finished the washing up and was sitting on the floor of the cockpit with her arms stretched behind her head. Clifford asked her. To their surprise, she accepted as though she had known them a long time and they were simply inviting her to tea. Well, but <clears throat> look here, said John, thoroughly taken back. 
What about your things? My things. She looked inquiringly, and a little defensively from one to the other. Clothes and so on. Or haven't you got any? Are you a gypsy or something? Where do you come from? I'm not a gypsy. She began patiently. And Clifford, thoroughly embarrassed and ashamed, interrupted her. <laughs> really? It's none of our business who you are. And uh, there is absolutely no need for us to ask you anything. I'm very glad you will come with us, although I feel we should warn you that we are new to this life and anything might happen. No need to warn me, she said, and smiled gratefully at him. After that, they both felt bound to ask her nothing. John because he was afraid of being made to look foolish by Clifford and Clifford because he had stopped John from doing that very thing. <clears throat> Good lord. She'll never get rid of her. She'll fuss about condensation. John had muttered aggressively as he started the engine. But she was very young and did not fuss about anything. She had told them her name and settled down and immediately and easily Gentle, assured, and unselfconscious to a degree remarkable in one so young. They were never sure how much she had overheard, for she gave no sign of having heard anything. She was a friendly, but uncommunicative creature. The map on the engine box started to <laughs> flap. And immediately John asked, Where are we? I haven't been watching, I'm afraid. Wait a minute. We just passed under a railway bridge, John said helpfully. Right, yes. About four miles from the junction, I think. What is the time? 5.30. Which way are we going when we get to the junction? We haven't time for the big loop. I must be back in London by the 15th. Well, the alternative is to go up as far as the basin and then simply turn around and come back. Who wants to do that? Well... We'll know the route then, and it'll be much easier coming back. Clifford did not reply. He was not attracted by the route being easier, and he wanted to complete his original plan. Let us wait till we get there, Sharon appeared with tea and marmalade sandwiches. All right, let's wait. Clifford was relieved. <coughs> It'll be almost dark by 6.30. I think we have ought to have a plan, John said. Thank you, Sharon. Have tea first. She curled herself onto the floor with her back to the cabin doors and a mug in her hands. There were passing rows of little houses with gardens that backed onto the canal. There were long, narrow strips streaked with cinder paths and crowded with vegetables and chicken huts, fruit trees and perambulators sometimes ending with fat white ducks, and sometimes in a tiny patch of grass with a bench on it. Would you rather keep ducks or sit on a bench? asked Clifford. Keep ducks, said John promptly. More useful. Sharon wouldn't mind what she did. Would you, Sharon? He liked saying her name, Clifford noticed. You could be happy anywhere. Couldn't you? He seemed to be presenting her... Oh, that's cool. That's right. It's John. You could be happy anywhere, couldn't you? He seemed to be presenting her with the wildest, widest po possible choice. I might be anywhere. She answered after a moment's thought. Well, you happen to be on a canal and very nice for us. In a wood, and on a canal, she replied contentedly, bending her smooth, dark head over her mug. Going to be fine tomorrow, said John. He was always a little embarrassed at any mention of how they found her and his subsequent rudeness. <sighs> yes, I like it when the whole sky is so red and the burning and it begins to be so cold. 
Are you cold? Said John, wanting to worry about her. Uh, wanting to worry about it. But she tucked her dark shirt into her trousers and answered composedly, Oh no, I'm never cold. They drank their tea in a comfortable silence. Clifford started to read his map and then said they were almost on to another sheet. New country, he said with satisfaction. I've never been here before. You make it sound like an exploration, doesn't he, Sharon? said John. Is that a bad thing? She collected the mugs. I'm going to put these away. You will call me again if I am wanted for anything. And she went into the cabin again. There was a second's pause, a minute, a minute tribute to her departure. And lighting cigarettes, they settled down to stare at the long stretch of water ahead. <clears throat> John thought about Sharon thought rather desperately that really they still knew nothing about her and that when they went back to London they would in all probability never see her again. Perhaps Clifford would fall in love with her and she would naturally reciprocate because she was so young and Clifford was reputed to be so fascinating and intelligent and because women were always foolish and loved the wrong man. He thought all these things with equal intensity and glanced cautiously at Clifford. Supposed he was thinking about her and wondered what she would be like in London, clad in anything else but her dark trousers and shirt. The engine <coughs> coughed, and he turned to it in relief. Clifford was making frantic calculations of time and distance, stretching their time and diminishing their distance, and groaning that with the utmost optimism they could not be made to fit. He was interrupted by John swearing at the engine, and then for no particular reason he remembered Sharon and reflected with pleasure how easily she left the mine when she was not present. How she neither obsessed nor possessed one in her absence, but was charming to see. Just a moment. The sun had almost set when they reached the junction, and John slowed down to neutral while they made up their minds. To the left was the straight cut, which involved the longer journey originally planned, and curving away to the right was the short arm, which John abdicated. The canal was fringed with rushes, and there was one small cottage with no light in it. Clifford went into the cabin to tell Sharon where they were, and then... As they drifted slowly in the middle of the junction, John suddenly shouted, <clears throat> Clifford! What's the third turning? Clifford reappeared. There are only two. Sharon is busy with dinner. No, look! Surely that is another cut. Clifford stared ahead. Can't see it? Just to the right of the cottage, look. It's not so dark as all that. And Clifford saw it very plainly. It seemed to wind away from the cottage on a fairly steep curve. And the rushes surrounding it from anything but the closest view were taller than the rest. <sighs> Have another look at the map. I'll reverse a bit. Oh, I see. I found it. It's just another arm. Probably being abandoned. Clifford said Clifford eventually. The boat had swung round, and now they could see the continuance of the curve dully gleaming ahead and banked by reeds. Well, what shall we do? It's getting dark. Let's go up a little way and more. Nice quiet mooring. Hmm. With some nice quiet mud banks, said John grimly. Nobody uses that. How do you know? Well, look at it. All those rushes. It's sure to be thick with weed. Well, don't go up it then. But we shall go aground if we drift about like this. I don't mind going up it, said John doggedly. What about Sharon? What about her? Tell her about it. We found a third turning, Clifford called above the noise of the Primus through the cabin door. One you had not expected. Yes, it uh, looks very wild. We were thinking of going up it. 
Didn't you say you wanted to explore? She smiled at him. You are quite right, ready to try it. I warn you, we shall probably run her hard aground. Look out for bumps with the Primus. I am quite ready. And I am quite sure we shan't run aground. She answered with charming confidence in their skill. <clears throat> they moved slowly forward in the dusk. Why they did not run aground, Clifford could not imagine. John really was damned good at it. The canal wound and wound, and the reeds grew not only thick on each bank, but in clumps across the canal. The light drained out of the sky into the water and slowly drowned there. The trees in the banks became heavy and black. Clifford began to clear things away from the heavy dew which had begun to rise. After two journeys, he remained in the cabin while John crawled on alone. Once on a bend, John thought he saw a range of hills ahead with lights on them. But when he was around the curve and had time to look again, he could see no hills. Only a dark, indeterminate waste of country stretched ahead was beginning to consider the necessity of mooring. And when they came to a bridge and shortly after he saw a dark mass which he took to be houses, when the boat had crawled for another 50 yards or so, he stopped the engine, drifted in absolute silence to the bank. The houses, there was about a half a dozen of them, were much nearer than he had first imagined, but there were no lights to be seen. Distance is always deceptive in the dark, he thought and jumped ashore with a bowline. When a few minutes later he took a sounding with the boat hook, the water proved unexpectedly deep, and he concluded that they had incredible good fortune, moored at the village wharf. He made everything fast and joined to the others in the cabin with mixed feelings of pride and resentment that he had achieved so much under such difficult conditions, and that they, by they, he meant Clifford, should have contributed so little towards the achievement. He found Clifford reading Bradshaw's Guide to Canals and Navigatable Rivers. <clears throat> In one corner, Anne Sharon, with her hair pushed back behind her ears, bending over the primus with a knife. Her ears are pale, exactly the color of her face, he thought. Wanted to touch them and then felt horribly ashamed and hated Clifford. <clears throat> let's have a look at Bradshaw he said as though he had not noticed Clifford reading it but Clifford handed him the book in the most friendly manner remarking that he couldn't see where they were in fact you've surpassed yourself with your brilliant navigation you seem to be miles from anywhere what's your famous what about your famous ordinance it's not on the sheet I have the new one I thought we should only cover the loops covers. <laughs> I'm gonna restart that sentence. The new one I thought we should use only covers the loop we planned. There is precisely three quarters of a mile of this canal shown on the present sheet, and when we run off the map, I suppose there must have been trade here, but I cannot imagine what or where. I expect things change, said Sharon. Here is the meal. How can you see to cook? said asked John, eyeing his plate ravenously. There is a candle. Yes, but we've selfishly appropriated that. Should I need more light? she asked and looked troubled. There's no should about it, I just don't know how you do it, that's all. Chips exactly the right color. By the way, chips, fries, this is English. And you never drop anything. It's marvelous. She smiled a little uncertainly at him and lit another candle. Luck, probably, she said and set it on the table. They ate their meal and John told them about the mooring. Some sort of village. I think we're moored at <clears throat> the wharf. I couldn't find any rings without the torch, so I've used the anchor. This small shaft was intended for Clifford, who had drop the spare the small 
shaft was intended for Clifter, who had dropped the spare torch battery in the washing up bowl and forgotten to buy another. But it was only a small shaft. And immediately afterwards, John felt much better for having the shaft here, meaning like Barb. He's like poking at him, making fun of him. Um, <clears throat> his aggression slowly left him and he felt nothing but a peaceful and well-fed affection for the other two. Extraordinary cutoff this is, he remarked over coffee. <clears throat> it is very pleasant in here. Warm and extremely full of us. Yes, I know. A quiet village, though, you must admit. I shall believe in your village when I see it. Then you won't... Then you would believe it? No. <clears throat> he wouldn't, Sharon. Not if he didn't want to. Not. And couldn't find it on the map. That map. The conversation turned again to their remoteness and to how cut off one liked to be and at what point it ceased to be desirable to boats and telephones and finally canals, which Clifford maintained the possessed the perfect proportions of urbanity and solitude. Hours later, when they turned in for the night, Clifford reviewed the conversation together with others they had had and remembered with surprise how little Sharon had actually said. She listened to everything, and occasionally when they appealed to her, made some small, composed remark, which was oddly at variance with their passionate interest. She has an elusive quality of freshness about her, he thought, which is neither naive, nor stupid, nor dull. She invokes no responsibility. She does not want us to know what she was or why we found her as we did, and curiously I at least do not want to know. She is what woman ought to be, he concluded with sudden pleasure and slept. He woke the next morning to find it very late and stretched out his hand to wake John. <clears throat> Ugh, we've overslept. Look at the time. Good Lord, better wake Sharon. Sharon lay between them on the floor, which they had seated her because, oddly enough, it was the widest and most comfortable bed. She seemed profoundly asleep, but at the mention of her name, sat up immediately and rose almost as though she had not been asleep at all. The morning routine, which involving the clothing of three people and shaving of two of them, was necessarily a long and complicated business, began. Sharon boiled water, and Clifford, grumbling gently, hoisted himself out of his bunk and repaired with a steaming jug to the cockpit. He put the jug on a seat and lifted the canvas awning and leaned out. It was absolutely gray and still. A little white mist hung over the canal and the country stretched out desolate and unkempt on every side with no sign of a living creature. The village, he thought suddenly. John's village. And was possessed of a perilous uncertainty and fear. I'm getting worse, he thought. This holiday is doing me no good. I'm mad. I imagined that he said we were moored by a village wharf. For several seconds, he stood gripping the gunwale and searching desperately for anything. Huts, a clump of trees, which could in the darkness have been mistaken for a village. There was nothing near the boat except tall, rank rushes, which did not move at all. Then, when his suspense was becoming unbearable, John joined him with another steaming jug of water. <clears throat> we shan't get here anywhere at this rate, he began, and then... Hello? Where's my village? I was wondering that, said Clifford. He could almost have wept with relief and quickly began to shave, deeply ashamed of his private panic. Can't understand it, John was saying. It was no joke, Clifford decided, as he listened to his hearty, puzzled ruminations. At breakfast, John continued to speculate upon what he had and had not seen. And Sharon listened intently while she filled the coffee pot and cut the bread. <clears throat> Once or twice, she met Clifford's eyes with a glance of discreet amusement. I must be mad. 
Or else the whole place is haunted, finished John comfortably. These two possibilities seemed to relieve him of any further anxiety in the matter, as he ate a huge breakfast and sat about greasing the engine. <clears throat> well, said Clifford, when he was alone with Sharon, what do you make of that? It's easy to be deceived in such matters, she answered perfunctorily. Evidently. Still, John is an unlikely candidate, you must admit. Here, I'll, I'll help you dry. Oh no, it's what I am here for. Um, not entirely, I hope. Not entirely. She smiled and relinquished the cloth. John eventually announced that they were ready to start. Clifford, who had assumed that they were to recover their journey, was surprised and frankly a little alarmed to find John intent upon continuing it. He seemed undeterred by the state of the canal, which, as Clifford immediately pointed out, rendered navigation both arduous and unrewarding. He announced that the harder it was, the more he liked it, adding very firmly that, anyways, we must see what happens. We shan't have time to do anything else. Thought you wanted to explore. I do, but what do you think, Sharon? I think, John, you will have to be a very good navigator to manage that. She indicated the rush and weed-ridden reach before them. Do you think it's possible? Well, <clears throat> of course it's possible. Probably need some help, though. I'll help you, she said. So on they went. There's a water break here. They made incredibly slow progress. John enjoyed showing off his powers to her, though Clifford, half amused, half exasperated, as he struggled for the fourth time in an hour to scrape weeds off the propeller, Sharon eventually retired to cook lunch. Surprising amount of water here, John said suddenly. Oh? Well, I mean, with all this weed and stuff, you'd expect the canal to have silted up. Sure, nobody uses it. The whole thing is extraordinary. Is it too late in the year for birds? asked Clifford later. No, I don't think so. Why? I haven't heard one, have you? I haven't noticed, I'm afraid. There's someone. Anyway, first sign of life. An old man stood near the bank watching them. He's dressed in corduroy, wore a straw hat. Good morning, shouted John as they drew nearer. He made no reply, but inclined his head slightly. He seemed very old. He was leaning on a scythe, and as they drew almost level with him, he turned away and began slowly cutting rushes. A pile of them lay neatly stacked beside him. Where does this canal go? Is there a village further on? Clifford and John asked simultaneously. He seemed not to hear. And as they chugged steadily past, Clifford was about to suggest that they stop and ask again when he called after them. Three miles up, you'll find the village. Three miles up, that is. And turned away to his rushes again. Well, now we know something anyways, said John. We don't even know what the village is called. Soon find out, only three miles. Three miles, said Clifford darkly. That might mean anything. You want to turn back? Oh no, not now. I want to see this village now. My curiosity is thoroughly aroused. Shouldn't think there'll be anything to see. Never been in such a wild spot. Look at it. Clifford looked at it, half wilderness, half marsh. Marsh. Dank, gray, and still, with single trees bare of their leaves, clumps of hawthorn that might have once been hedge, sparse and sharp with berries, and in the distance, hills and an occasional wood. These were all one could see beyond the lines of rushes which edged the canal winding ahead. They stopped for a lengthy meal, which Sharon described as lunch and tea together, it being so late. And then, 
Appalled how little daylight was left, continued. <clears throat> We've hardly been any distance at all, said John forlornly. Good that th there were no locks. I shouldn't think they'd have worked if they were. <clears throat> Much more than three miles, he said about two hours later. The darkness was descending and it was becoming very cold. Better stop, said Clifford. Not yet, I'm determined to reach that village. Dinner is ready, said Sharon sadly. It will be cold. Let's stop. You have your meal, I'll call if I want you. Sharon looked at them and Clifford shrugged his shoulders. Come on, I will, I'm tired of this. They shut the cabin doors and John could hear the pleasant chatter of their meal. And just as he was coming to the end of the decent interval, which he felt must elapse before he gave in, they passed under a bridge, the first of the day. Clutching at any straw, he immediately assumed that it had prefaced the village. I think we're nearly there, he called. Clifford opened the door. The village! Well, no, a bridge, but it can't be far now. Mad, John, it's pitch dark. You can see the bridge, though. Yes. Why not moor under it? Ah, too late. Can't turn round in this light. She's no good at reversing. Must be nearly there. You go back. I don't need you. Clifford shut the door again. He was beginning to feel irritated with John behaving in this childish manner, showing off to impress Sharon. It was amusing in the morning, but really he was carrying it a bit far. Let him manage the thing himself then. When a few minutes later, John shouted that they had reached the sought-after village, Clifford merely pulled back the little curtain over a cabin window, rubbed the condensation, and remarked that he could see nothing. No light, at least. He is happy, anyhow, Sharon said peacefully. Going to have a look around, said John, slamming the cabin doors and... <laughs> blowing his nose. Surely you'll eat first. If you've anything left, my god, it's cold. It is unnaturally cold. We won't be held responsible if he dies of exposure, will we? said Clifford. She looked at him, hesitated a moment, but then did not reply and placed a steaming plate in front of John. She doesn't want us to quarrel, Clifford thought. And with an effort of friendliness, he asked, so what does tonight's village look like? Much the same, only one or two houses, you know. But the old man called it a village. It seemed uncommunicative. Clifford thought he was sulking, but after eating the meal, he suddenly announced, almost apologetically, I don't think I shall walk around. I'm absolutely worn out. You go if you like, I shall start turning in. All right, I'll have a look. You've had a hard day. Clifford pulled on a coat and went outside. And it was, as John said, incredibly cold. Almost overwhelmingly silent. The clouds hung very low over the boat and the mist was rising everywhere from the ground, but he could dimly discern the black huddle of cottages lying on a little slope above the bank against which the boat was moored. He did actually set foot on that shore, but his shoe sank immediately into a marshy hole. He withdrew it and changed his mind. The prospect of groping around those dark and silent houses became suddenly distasteful, and he joined the others with the excuse that it was too cold, and that he was also tired. A little later, he lay half-conscious, in a kind of restless trance, with John sleeping heavily opposite him his mind seemed full of foreboding fear of something unknown and intangible he thought of them lying in warmth on the cold secret canal with desolate miles of water behind and probably beyond the old man and the silent houses john cut off and asleep, and Sharon, who lay on the floor beside him, immediately he was filled with a sudden 
and most violent desire for her, even to touch her, for her to know that he was awake. Sharon, he whispered. Sharon, Sharon. He stretched down his fingers in the dark. Instantly, her hand was in his, each smooth and separate finger warmly clasped. She did not move or speak, but his relief was indescribable. For a long while, he lay in an ecstasy of delight and peace, till his mind slipped imperceptibly with her fingers into oblivion. When he woke, he found John absent and Sharon standing over the Primus. He's outside, she said. Have I ever slept again? Oh, it is late. I am boiling water for you now. We better try and get some supplies this morning. There is no village, she said in a matter of fact tone. What? John says not, but we have enough food, if you don't mind this queer milk from a tin. Hmm. No, uh, I don't mind, he replied, watching her affectionately. Doesn't really surprise me, he added after a moment. The village? No village. Yesterday I should have minded awfully as that you, do you think? Perhaps... Doesn't surprise you about the village at all, does it? Do you love me? She glanced at him quickly, a little shocked, and said quietly, Don't you know? Then added, It doesn't surprise me. John seemed very disturbed. I don't like it, he kept saying as they shaved. Can't understand it at all. Don't like it. I could have sworn there were houses last night. You saw them, didn't you? Y yeah. Well, don't you think it's very odd? I do. Everything looks the same as yesterday morning. I'm not. I don't like it. It's an adventure, you must admit. Yes, but I've had enough of it. I suggest we turn back. Sharon suddenly appeared, and seeing her, Clifford knew that he did not want to go back. He remembered her saying, Don't you say you wanted to, didn't you say you wanted to explore? She would think him weak hearted if they turned back all those dreary miles with nothing to show for it. At breakfast, he exerted himself in persuading John to the same opinion. John finally agreed to one more day, but in turn extracted a promise that they would then go back whatever happened. Clifford agreed to this, and Sharon, for some inexplicable reason, laughed at them both so that eventually they prepared to set off in an atmosphere of general good humor sharon began to fill the water tank with their four gallon can it seemed too heavy for her and john dropped the starter and leapt to her assistance she let him take the can and held the funnel for him and together they watched the rich even stream of water disappear you shouldn't try to do that, he said. You'll hurt yourself. Gypsies do it, she said. Ah, I'm awfully sorry about that. You know I am. I should not have minded if you had thought I was a gypsy. I do like you, he said, not looking at her. I do like you. You won't disappear altogether when this is over, will you? probably won't find I'll disappear for good come on shouted Clifford it's all right for him to talk to her John thought as he struggled to swing the starter he just doesn't like me doing it and he wished as he'd begun often to do that Clifford was not there they had spasmodic engine troubles in the morning, which slowed them down, and the consequent halts with the difficulty they experienced of mooring anywhere. The banks seemed nothing but marsh, were depressing and cold. 
Their good spirits evaporated. By lunchtime, John was plainly irritable and frightened, and Clifford had begun to hate the gray, silent land on either side, with the woods and hills which remained so consistently distant. They both wanted to give up by then but john felt bound to stick to his promise and clifford was secretly sure that sharon wished to continue while she was preparing another late lunch they saw a small boy who stood on what was once had been the towpath watching them he was bareheaded wore corduroy and had no shoes he held a long reed the end of which he chewed as he stared at them ask him where we are said john and clifford asked he took the reed out of his mouth, but did not reply. Where do you live then? asked Clifford as they drew almost level with him. I told you. Three miles up, he said. And then he gave a sudden little shriek of fear and dropped the reed and turned to run down the bank the way they had come. Once he looked back, he stumbled and fell and picked himself up sobbing and ran even faster. Sharon had appeared with lunch a moment before, and together they listened to his gasping cries grow fainter and fainter until he had run himself out of their sight. What on earth frightened him, said Clifford. I don't know, unless it was Sharon popping out of the cabin like that. Nonsense, but he was a very frightened little boy, and I say, do you realize? He was a very foolish little boy. Sharon interrupted. She was angry, Clifford noticed with surprise. Really angry. White and trembling with a curious expression which he did not like. Well, we might have gotten something out of him, said John sadly. Too late now, Sharon said. She had quite recovered herself. They saw no one else. They journeyed on throughout the afternoon. It grew colder and at the same time more and more airless still. When the light began to fail, Sharon disappeared as usual to the cabin. The canal became more torturous and John asked Clifford to help him with the turns. Clifford complied unwillingly. He did not want to leave Sharon, but as it had been he who had insisted on their continuing, he could hardly refuse. The turns were nerve-wracking as the canal was very narrow and the light grew worse and worse. All right, if we to stop soon, asked John eventually. Stop now if you like. Well, we'll try and find a tree to tie to. The swamp is awful. I can't think how that child ran. That child, began Clifford anxiously, but John, who had been equally unnerved by the incident and did not want to think about it, interrupted. Is there a tree anywhere? Can't see one. It's a hell of a bend coming up, though. Almost back on itself. Better slow a bit more. Can't. We're right down as it is. They crawled round, clinging to the outside bank, which seemed always to approach them. Its rushes to rub against their bows. Although the wheel was hard over, John grunted with relief, and they both stared ahead for the next turn. They were presented with the most terrible spectacle the canal immediately broadened until no longer a canal but a sheet in infinity of water stretched ahead oily and silent and still as far as the eye could see with no country edging it nothing but water to the low gray sky above it john had almost immediately cut out the engine and now he tried desperately to start it again in order to turn around. Clifford instinctively glanced behind them, but he saw no canal, no inlet. Grasping close to the stern of the boat, the reeds and rushes of a marshy waste were closing in behind them. He stumbled to the cabin doors and pulled them open. It was very neat and tidy in there, but empty. Only one stern door of the cabin was free of its catch, and it flapped irregularly backwards and forwards with their movements in the boat. And there was no sign of Sharon at all. 
And that is the end of Three Miles Up by Elizabeth Jane Howard. Now, I will say I understand that some people don't like open-ended stories like that. I don't think it's that open-ended, but it's definitely a story that requires you to circle back, think about the things that have happened. Um, but I won't ruin the fun of that for you. Um, nonetheless, uh, it was... It was interesting, because when I first read this story, I was like, I it's too long. I don't know where I'd fit it in. It's not headline material or whatever. And I sort of just put it aside and was looking at other stories. And something about this story really stuck with me i don't know that it's that scary exactly but i do think that uh the story itself is i think maybe haunting is the right word it sticks with you i don't think it really does anything you don't expect at least not on like a, a general level but there is something about it that really sticks. I think it's just a good story. It kept me interested throughout, and hopefully that was the same for you. Gia says, oh, come on. Well, I mean, in truth, it's hard for me to say exactly what it is. It has obvious, I guess one thing I will say is on a thematic level, it has obvious references to feminist themes. And this was written by a woman in the 50s, so I don't think that's accidental. Um, <clears throat> The way Sharon is portrayed is is very much in line with certain critiques about how men perceive women, uh, especially at that time. But uh, and nonetheless, that's not my. I'm, I'm not a story explainer. I'm a storyteller, <laughs> and I will let you folks have your time with it. Um, <clears throat> well, we've gone long as I knew we would, uh, but uh, just a reminder that tomorrow we are finishing. Joseph Gagawin uh book My Indian Summer, uh, which is on the Big Van Book Club at 6.30 p.m. tomorrow with Avalon Bourne. Uh, extremely popular right now. <laughs> it's one of the most popular channel videos I have on this channel, uh, which is to say probably not popular in a YouTube sense, but popular in a there's a reading requirement to go and watch that stream sense. You wouldn't think that would do well on YouTube. Um <clears throat> That is uh, tomorrow um, at 6.30. And we'll wrap up our second season of Big Van Book Club. Uh, just finish the book at this point if you're only picking it up. Or if you don't want to join the club, um, just read the book. It's a really good book. Beyond that, my name is Rory. I'll be back tomorrow night and Thursday night, both at 6.30 p.m. Pacific, right here on the Varietal Show, or on the Varietal Literature YouTube page. Also, if you're looking for horror stories, check down in the description below because my st horror story that I put up from last year, uh, An Odd Place for a Gallery, is linked down below. And also, my Choose Your Own Adventure from last year, The Horror House, is linked down below. You can also watch a stream of me playing that with stream, which is, again, one of my more popular videos on this channel. Um, beyond that, my throat hurts from talking for 90 minutes, so I'm going to sign off. I'll keep the fire going for you. What's that behind you? Thank you.